Our reading this morning is from 1 Peter 1, 22 to chapter 2, verse 3. Now that by your obedience to the truth you have purified yourselves and have come to have a sincere love for your fellow believers, love one another earnestly with all your heart. For through the living and eternal word of God, you have been born again as a children of a parent who is immortal, not mortal. As the scripture says, all human beings are like grass and all their glory is like wild flowers. The grass with us and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. The word is the good news that was proclaimed to you. Read yourselves then of all evil, no more lying or hypocrisy or jealousy or insulting language. Be like newborn babies, always thirsty for the pure spiritual milk, so that by drinking it you may grow up and be saved. As the scripture says, you have found out for yourselves how kind the Lord is. This is the word of the Lord. Gracious Lord, we do thank you for your abiding word that teaches us and nourishes us, shapes and fashions us by the power of your spirit. And we pray now, gracious Father, as your word is open to us and proclaimed, that we'll hear your voice, that you will teach our minds and instruct our hearts. Lord, we pray that we might know more of you and more of your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now please do turn to 1 Peter, chapter 1. As we look at that together, um, chapter 1, verse 22 to 2, verse um, 3, we'll look at today. Born as a wise man amongst jokers and fools, it really is the worst. Holding out pearls to the swine and the hogs, it really is a curse. Life really could be a blast if I didn't rub shoulders with idiots. I might even find it a barrel of laughs if I didn't rub shoulders with idiots. Turn up to work and sit at my desk, glance over at the idiot at the next. Why am I surrounded by fools? Walk as a sober man amongst drunks and clowns. It really is vexing. Driving so skilled around the mad and the loon, it really is quite taxing. Life really could be a lark if I didn't rub shoulders with idiots. I might even find it a walk in the park if I didn't rub shoulders with idiots. Turn over in bed and off with the light, aware that the idiots will survive the night. Why am I surrounded by fools? Well, that was my diary entry from last month. <laughs> um, it wasn't in my diary, but I did actually make it up. But I made it up for this morning. Really, why? Well, to just really get to the heart of the fact that a lot of the time, we do find it difficult to live around other people, don't we? Uh, we find it difficult to um, exist with um, other sinners. And so you take that, and then you combine it with the fact that our Lord says, love your neighbor as yourself. Peter commands that we love one another deeply from the heart. And yet my heart says, well, that would be all good and well if people weren't so difficult to love. So how do we respond to the difficult people that we rub shoulders with every day and as part of this fellowship? How do we respond to the people who rub us up the wrong way? You know, Peter is aware that when you're under pressure, it's those around you who can often get burnt by the steam <laughs> that gets let off. And as he wrote to these Christians, they were under pressure. They were undergoing um, persecution. And he knew it would be easy for them to turn on one another. And so he gives them this command to love one another deeply um, from um, the heart. He reminds them in the opening two verses, 22 and 23, that they were born um, to love. 
So Christian has been born again by the Word of God. A new life has begun for us. We've been given a new heart, and written on that new heart is that royal law to love your neighbor as yourself. We've been born um, to love. I don't know if you've ever seen the Horrible Histories. Uh, Horrible Histories is excellent. I recommend it for getting to know stuff about uh, the history um, of the world. It's done in a comical way. Um, But one of the uh, songs uh, is about the King Georges, Georges 4, 3, 1, and 2. And it states this. This is the chorus. We were born to rule over you, You had to do what we told you to just because our blood was blue. (laughs) Okay, born to rule. That's um, the episode, and it talks about how they did that. But with us, Peter is reminding us, and in later chapters he'll tell us that royal blood is coursing through our veins as Christians. But we've been born again by this word, but we've been born to love. Born um, to love. That's the command in verse 22. There are two commands that we'll look at. The first one is this one, to love one another deeply from the heart. But love is such a slippery word, isn't it, that we have to give um, content to it. It must be given (coughs) biblical um, content. And the first thing we see about love is that love is sincere. That's what he says, isn't it? Sincere um, love. Literally, without hypocrisy. Love doesn't wear a mask. It doesn't uh, pretend to be something that it's not. I wonder if you've had this experience where you, you walk into a room, maybe if you're walking into church, and somebody you know that somebody has seen you and you've seen them, but they turn away and then they turn back with a smile on their face. And you're fully aware that the, file is, the smile is fake. <laughs> They're away, uh, aware that the smile is fake. And they turned away to put the the mask um, on. It's not sincere. Uh, It's not um, genuine. They just turn away. Now, this Greek word for love that we're thinking about is uh, brotherly love, uh, or literally, it's translated, love of the same womb. So, love for someone of the same womb as you. Now, I know we have different people have different relationships with their siblings. Um, I recognize that. But genuinely, generally speaking, um, the love that you have for your siblings is sincere. What you see is what you get. Usually, the, you don't hide things, do you? Things are out in the, um, in the open. And here, we're being told as Christians that our love for one another is to be sincere, is to be real, genuine, not um, fake. But the second thing we're told is that this love is to be deep. (coughs) Love one another deeply. Now, outside in the New Testament, this word for deep was used of horses galloping. A horse that was galloping and galloping. It carries the idea of going the distance, keeping um, going. Deeply, as in not shallow. Having substance, a love that has substance, it's not easily dried up. It's not easily uprooted. It's deep. We express this uh, in a song that we sing um, regularly. Oh, the deep. It's about the love of Jesus for us, but oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of your love. And that is the kind of love that is to mark us out as a fellowship For one another. It's a love that keeps going. It goes the distance. It's deep. It doesn't dry up and it's not easily uprooted. But the third thing we find out about this love is that it's pure. It says, love one another deeply from the heart. It's pure from the heart. I'm not loving. We shouldn't be loving one another for what we can get out of it. If I can get something from you. I'm not, we shouldn't love each other in order to grow in favor with the other person or to place that person in our debt or to be thought well of or to be accepted um, or um, to be thought well of and respected by others in the church. No, it's from the heart. It's, 
It's pure. It doesn't have other motives. Its single motive is that we are children of God who have been called and born again to love one another deeply. Our love is to be pure, not polluted by self-interest, not polluted by seeking self-gratification. It's to be a pure love, a holy love. You see, our love for one another shouldn't be fickle, it shouldn't be frail, it shouldn't um, fail, because the word that gave birth to this love is none of those things. This kind of love that we're talking about, to really live it, we recognize that it's demanding, we recognize that it will be um, draining, but what Peter reminds us of is that we've been empowered to love uh, in this way. Uh, verses 22 through to 25. <clears throat> he says we've been released um, from that which um, entangles, verse 22. We've had our souls purified, uh, having purified yourselves, uh, having our souls um, purified through obedience um, to um, the truth. God's truth clears out um, our souls of the sinful um, baggage so that this, this pure, sincere, deep love can filter down into our hearts and flow out um, to other people. We need to be disentangled uh, of um, sin in order to love in this way. One of my favorite cordial syrups is um, elderflower. And when I was at um, college, uh, one of the lecturer's wives made me some, and she brought it round. But then when I looked inside the bottle, it was just full of bugs <laughs> and bits uh, inside. Now, the lecturer was German, his wife was German. I guess it wasn't a problem to them. But obviously, as a Brit, I thought, we've got to get these bugs and bits out. So I tried to filter it out, and I tried to use one of those coffee filters, but it was, the syrup was too thick, and then I used this sieve. And I managed to get all the bugs and bits out so I could enjoy, enjoy it. And what Peter is saying here is, look, the Word of God purifies us, it, it untangles, it filters out the sin so that we can love in the way that God has called us um, to love. Well, let me put it another um, way. We have three of these in our house because we have three children. We seem to get three of everything. Um, it's a drone. Okay. Now, this drone is supposed to fly, but as you can see, it's not doing a very good job. I mean, it sometimes um, flies, but what happens is it goes around the house and do, the children do some flying, but then the four blades, one of the blades will get a bit of fluff or a hair on it and get tangled up. And as soon as one of the blades is tangled, it can no longer fly. It can no longer get off the ground. It can no longer go up in the air and, and be directed in the way that you want it to be directed. And so it is with our love for one another. If we're entangled, and we're going to come on to think about some of the things that entangle in chapter 2, verse 1. If we get entangled by um, those sins, we cannot love, our love cannot fly and soar in the way that it should. But the Word of God purifies us all. The Word of God untangles us um, from those sins so that we can love um, one another. There is so much that pollutes Oh, so that the stream of love cannot run clearly uh, and out to refresh um, others. Bitterness uh, pollutes the waters. Self-centeredness poisons um, that love and chokes it out. Anger, anger spoils what we intend to be. But God's truth disentangles our hearts so that we can love one another sincerely, deeply, and from the heart. But here's another thing. We're recharged by that which endures. We're recharged by that which endures. I don't know if you noticed, but really there are two seeds um, in this section of 1 Peter. There's the perishable seed that produces um, human life. Verse 24, all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flower fall. So we're born to die. and we, we, we come from perishable um, seed. That is our destiny as 
um, humans. But in contrast to that, uh, in verse 23, there's the imperishable seed of God's Word. See, when that seed takes root in us, we're reborn to love, and we're continually recharged to love as God intends us, to, intends us to be. So when we're talking about this love, this love cannot be generated from within us. And we're not trying to say that love out of a dead, cold, lifeless heart, which is what we would be without the rebirth that comes through the Word and the Spirit. But no, we're loving, we're empowered, recharged to love through um, the Word of God, this imperishable word of God, brings about an imperishable love. This imperishable word of God brings about an imperishable love. Now, Peter, even in chapter 1, he spoke so much about, he loves this imperishable um, truth. Um, in verse 4, it says, our inheritance isn't perishable. Verse 7, our faith isn't perishable. Um, verse 18, the ransom by which we were purchased is not perishable. And now in verse 23, God's word is not perishable. What's the point? Well, the point is this. Peter is saying what God does endures. What God starts, he finishes. What God does lasts eternally. And that includes the love that is given birth by the imperishable um, word. We're to love one another deeply from the heart. Earthly love fades and fails, but the love brought about by God's word endures and empowers. Now just ponder this because it's a real powerful um, connection. The imperishable word produces new life in us, and it also produces an imperishable love for fellow Christians. Now, therefore, there's a direct connection, and we must think about this more, between our understanding and reading of God's Word and our love um, for one another. True brotherly love that is sincere and not superficial, that goes the distance, doesn't give up, that is pure and not polluted, ought to flow as a result of God's imperishable word planted in us. So Peter says, look, as Christians, you've been born to love, you've been empowered to love, and now you must grow in love, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. This word that grows us never goes out of fashion, and it keeps us from doing the things that are contrary to love. Did you notice all those sins in chapter 2, verse 1 are relational sins? They're things that damage um, love um, for one another. Here's how you stunt the growth of love. You stunt the growth of love by being cruel, by being a cruel individual. If you're a Christian, um, you must strip yourself of these five things, get them out of your life, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. These five things, they're out of style. They no longer suit you as one who's been born to love through the imperishable word. Put simply, Peter's saying, look, it's time for a new wardrobe change. It's time for a change of wardrobe. So what I'm going to do now, just for a few minutes, I'm going to hold up these items of clothing and that Peter mentioned. I'm going to hold them up to you. And I want you to mentally say, just say to yourself uh, in your head, look, that no longer suits me. That doesn't look good on me. So here's the first. Look at this shirt. It says malice in the label. Malice is that uh, desire to um, hurt someone with your words or your um, deeds. It's like a little malice, it's a little smoldering, like a little fire of resentment uh, that lives um, inside you, that wants ill um, for another, that causes you to lash out in your thoughts, words, and actions. And my friends, this shirt called malice 
He has such a tight collar, it chokes out love. And so it doesn't look good on you as a Christian. You need to get rid of it. Well, here's a hat. It's called deceit. This word that's used, deceit, Peter would have been very familiar with it, as would have other uh, fishermen, because it literally means to bait the hook, to bait the hook. So uh, a fisherman has his hook, he puts the bait on it to disguise the hook, uh, and then the fish comes along, takes the bait, and is, and is hooked. So it's when you play a trick, deceit, it's, you play a trick in order to get your own way. A bit of deceit to cover up your back, a bit of deceit to advance your cause. Uh, you, you deceive uh, people, or you've been deceitful when you tell a lie, or when you admit part of the truth, in order to gain personal uh, advantage. But deceit crushes um, love. And so as a Christian, <laughs> deceit doesn't look good <laughs> on you. Well, here's a mask for you to wear. It's called hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is, um, we spoke about this before, it's taken from the theatres where people used to wear masks in order to be different characters. That's the meaning of the word hypocrisy, to wear a, a, a mask, to pretend to be something that you're not. Well, how can we love each other? How can we have a sincere love, loving one another deeply from the heart, from the heart, that pure, if we don't really know who we are, who the other person is. Because hypocrisy conceals who you actually are. So that you present something to people that is not you. And therefore, love is concealed. Love is hidden. And that is not a fitting outfit for a follower of Jesus. It doesn't look good on you. Well, what about this bag from the envy range? Uh, envy is um, jealousy at the success of um, others or them having something that um, you want or happiness at another person's misfortune. Um, and it's envy poisons um, the soul, turns you into a, a resentful, angry, grouchy, miserable, critical person. And if you possess this bag, envy, it's time to get rid of it. Because it no longer suits you, and envy murders love. Envy murders love. It doesn't look good on you. Well, here is a pair of shoes by slander. You can walk all over people in these shoes. These shoes were made for walking and tramping on others down. Slander is to speak down of um, someone, to discredit uh, them. It includes... Gossip, backbiting, spreading uh, rumors, making up bad reports, sharing of information that you do so in order to damage their reputation. But you can't walk in love if you wear shoes by slander because they'll bring you down and they'll bring others down around you. So if you possess any of these, it's time to clear out the wardrobe because they don't look good on you. And it's time to start shopping at Christ's store where the designer label is love. Because love does look good on you. And it never goes out of fashion. So how do we nourish the growth of love? Well, we do so by craving pure spiritual milk. As Sam said, Craving is that idea of longing after, desiring, um, needing something, knowing that it's a necessity, that it's vital um, to you. And here we're told that we're to crave pure spiritual milk, the Word of God. So does your life demonstrate um, that? Do the, your pri the pri priorities of your day uh, manifest that, that you crave pure spiritual milk, the milk of God's Word? Because Peter is making it clear that there's a direct connection between longing for God's truth and growing in love for God's people. 
They're connected together. Or put in the other direction, the way that we treat one another has a direct impact on our growing relationship with Christ. Because if we harbor these relational sins and wrong attitudes, they hinder our spiritual growth. They're like junk food for the, for the soul. They spoil our appetite for God's um, word. So that instead of growing, instead we're stunted. So let me put it this way. The pure milk of God's word turns sour in the heat of an unkind heart and fierce tongue. Let me just tell you a reality, a fact. And I know Melvin, who's been in ministry for a long time, will testify to this. When you go to somebody who has these sins in their heart, when they're, they're deceitful, malicious, hypocritical, and that marks them, their character out. And if they're claiming to be a Christian and you ask them about their reception of God's word, if they're being honest, it will always be very, very low. Or a superficial reading of it. Because they don't crave the pure spiritual milk. Because the pure, pure spiritual milk is in contradiction to the way that they want to live. And those sins just sour at the taste so that they don't like it. They don't want it. They don't desire it because it holds up a life that they don't actually want because they want this kind of life instead. You see, if our daily diet consists of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, you can be sure that the craving for God's Word will be diminished greatly because we're filling up on junk food. And as long as we do that, then we don't grow spiritually Even if you come to church twice on a Sunday or a part of a midweek Bible study, those relational sins will chuck off the Word of God in our lives. You see, it's interesting how Peter draws these together, doesn't he? Love and um, truth. We're people who live in truth and love, and we're to grow in truth and love. We've been born again of the imperishable Word of God in order to live a life of love. We've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And that pushes us out in good deeds towards others. And it brings a sweetness to our love for others. As we've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, the one in whom there is no deceit or malice or hypocrisy or envy or slander of any kind. And then we learn to love as he loves. So this morning's passage is calling us to grow in truth so that we can have a deepening love. But it's calling us to a deep love in order that we can have a greater desire for the truth. So brothers and sisters, this love that we've been speaking about, this love that endures as the word of God endures, therefore, Let there be sincere, deep, and pure love. May it abound amongst us as the word of God is honored amongst us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank and praise you for giving us new birth through your imperishable word. We praise you that that you rescued us by your love so that we can be part of your great company of love. Give us the power through your word and spirit so that we may love one another sincerely, deeply, and purely. That those around us might know that we are your disciples. Increase within us that desire for your word For without it, we cannot love as you would have us love. And may our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved to the uttermost, be exalted in our lives as we love one another. Amen.